I was in California this summer at the National. Were you guys there? Yeah. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. That hotel wasn't too shabby either. <laughs> we had the best time. And I came home and immediately went to see when our next regional was and found out it was here where we come to the beach. So signed myself up and the very next day got an email asking if I would present a workshop. Even more perfect. So I'm here to talk to you about my journey and um, my book, um, my life, and particularly my dwarfism and the arthritis that came along with my SED, <laughs> sister SED. I'm with you. That they taught me above all was that my, with my own vision, I could transform those obstacles into opportunities. And that just in looking at my dark times in a new light, it would start to change the circumstances themselves. It's almost magical. But the more we put our minds to seeing the best outcome, even if we've experienced the worst, we can really transform our own lives first and then those who we touch who is really a lot because little people were born to stand out. And so we're teaching as we go. We're messengers. Without having to do anything, we're being watched. And really, in many ways, being admired for our incredible adaptability, our courage to just walk out the day, walk out the door each day, uh, our, de our determination, our perseverance, people are watching, and so we really have a great responsibility to give the best of who we are, to not respond to their negativity, but really come from that inner joy that was there as a child, and it's still there. It's in everyone, an innate divinity and beauty that gets covered up by the world at times, but it's there, and it's our job to bring it back out. 25 years ago, I was 23, and I found this bookstore in Boston. And it was loaded with uh, books on personal growth. And books on every different spirituality and how they handled the darkness in their life. How did they take trauma and betrayal and loss and turn it into something worthwhile? And this gave me such hope. These authors, these writers who had been through their own difficulties and showed me that there was the possibility of transforming this incredible challenge that I was given. And I didn't know how I was going to do it, but just in the belief that it was possible, starts it rolling. And providence starts moving in, the right people show up. Things start to work so that we land on our true path. I read from an author, uh, George Osawa, he's a Buddhist philosopher, and from his background, he believed that the soul had the opportunity to choose some of its greatest obstacles before it was born. And I thought, what? Why would we choose this huge mountain to climb? Why? But it also was such an interesting new perspective to take our challenge and view it as a choice. That empowerment really appealed to me. And I, I went home, I was talking to a friend about it, and she and I looked at each other and we thought, if that is true, then what incarnation were we thinking? Because I had my own dysfunctional issues and she had a very difficult family life. But as we got talking and joking and letting our imagination roll, and Einstein says the imagination is more important than knowledge. It opens us up to solutions and possibilities that the world in its very small box may not be open to. So we were letting ourselves go on this, and this is the story that we came up with. And I've embellished on my own ever since. 
She and I decided that before we were born, we must have met up at the Spirit Pub. And the Spirit Pub is where all souls go to pick out their lifetime. And we knew that many chose a life on the rocks because the tougher the child, the greater the glory. And because it's all fun and games and spirit and you don't have a body to worry about and there's no disease or death, we were ready to take on the world when we bellied up to the bar. So when I looked up at this ginormous spirit pub menu, of all the possibilities, one stood out in the lights. Spondylo, epiphysial, dysplasia. And I thought, I could really sink my teeth into that. <laughs> and my guardian angel, who was right there with me to consult, said it, that also comes with a side order of degenerative arthritis. I said, I'll take it. And she said, excellent choice. Let me just give you a few pointers on that particular Earth costume. Number one, at your birth, the Earth gods of medicine will immediately label you defect, deformed, disabled, disadvantaged, disregard. All the D's. And I carried that as my identity for years. Someone else's definition of me. And my body instead of the true me. My angel said, but this profound human pain will stir in you such a hunger to know yourself and to heal yourself, that when you turn your vision toward that light, the darkness will become the catapult to alternative therapies, to empowering medicine, to teaching the doctors about our condition instead of vice versa. And I said, okay, maybe I can do that. And she said, wait, number two, my angel said, your body is going to be a billboard for other people's fears of never fitting in, never being good enough. Bullies and strangers and adults and children will laugh and taunt and mock you. And I said, uh, let me recheck the menu. And she said, but this devastating isolation will awaken in you such a desire for love and acceptance and connection. And because you won't be able to, you won't believe that you can draw that from the outside, you will eventually be called inside where your truth really lies. It will be a bridge back to your strength and your spirit. And she said, number three, your family, which will be the loving bedrock of your identity, will be silent about your challenges and your dwarfism. And you will misinterpret that silence as shame and rejection from the very people you believe love you the most. And she said, but this heartbreaking silence will ignite in you such a desire to express yourself through art, through writing, through speaking. And when you turn your vision toward that light, then the darkness, as it is supposed to, will catapult you into learning true communication from the heart. 
And with that megaphone, you can help others remember that their truth is within. It's not from other people's opinions. It's not from what people see. But it's that inner joy. And I said, I can do it. She said one more thing, and this is very important. You're going to forget all of this. And I said, oh, that part I know about. Because if I knew I was eternal, that I was light and love and spirit, then the earth journey would be like pin the tail on the donkey without the blindfold. There'd be no challenge in it. And she said, and I will be with you every step of the way. And I'll never leave you until you have fulfilled your reasons for being. And I said, then I'm in. I'm in. For birth and death and agony and ecstasy, I'll give it my best shot. And you know what? All the greatest challenges in my life have turned into incredible strengths when I ch chose how to look at them, when I saw them as choices, I said, I'm going to own this. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to find that silver lining. And as soon as we start looking, it's there. And we realize that we were the ones with the greatest self-imposed limitations because we listened to the outside world saying we weren't good enough, we didn't fit in. And everyone feels that way. It's not just LPs. Being human is a handicap. It's not easy. But there's a higher purpose. Because the challenge is going to bring out who you truly are and what you came to share. Fifteen years ago, I was a freelance artist. I was happy that I was able to do what I loved and make a meager living at it. But I was still hiding from the world. Without really consciously knowing that, I was, I was staying away, sort of licking my wounds, not sure I trusted anyone except my immediate friends and family, not sure I really wanted to be out there and seen and known. And life had a different idea for me. Because within just a few months of marrying my wonderful husband, who's here, my shoulder stopped working. And I'm a righty. And it was in pain. I was having these horrible spasms. I had already had both knees replaced, both hips replaced. So I knew it was my arthritis. But this felt so severe. But when I went to the doctor, he took one look at the x-ray and he said, you need a specialist specialist. Your shoulder is so abnormal and the arthritis is so advanced. Well, I was devastated. I did not want another replacement. And months went by. I could not do my work. I could not do much of anything because just walking sometimes would jar my shoulder so badly. I would end up on the couch with the ice pack and the medication and, and just dulled by the drugs and unhappy with life. And really going back into a pity party about my childhood and all the experiences I had had that I had not let go. I was holding those like armor. Like, if I hold on to them, they won't happen again. And instead, if you hold on to them, and you expect it, and you got a dark cloud around you, you bump into other dark clouds. And you think, oh, that's life, that's truth, when you no, know that's actually the truth we're carrying. And it's reflected out. It's reflected back to us so that we can see what we need to change. And that there are other dark clouds out there that do need our help. So in the midst of this depression and not knowing how was I going to get past this, maybe this is the last straw. Maybe my body will ruin everything. Maybe I'm not as good as average-sized people. And then my 
father suggested, and this was before most of us had computers, he suggested trying computer graphics with my left hand. And I did not want to give up my brush and pen, and I couldn't do much with my left hand. I had tried, but it looked like I was about mm, 30 years old. And so, without any other options, I thought, we'll give it a try. And my husband and I went out, we got an iMac, he got it up and scrolling, and before I could even start with computer graphics, I got hooked on email. And it was such a wonderful way to communicate with my friends and family and really tell them for the first time some of my experiences as a child, some of my points of view that were really warped and I didn't even know it. And to have them tell me, you know, that's how I feel. It's the same. I don't have dwarfism. I didn't have some of your challenges, but that's that human journey, trying to search for meaning and make sense of those tough times. And as I wrote, I started to feel better. Not just emotionally, but my shoulder wasn't locking up in pain as much. And one day, I was talking to my husband, telling him what I'd been writing about, that I was starting to see it in a whole different way from an objective point of view. Like, wow, what a story. This is a great underdog story that we're all living. Why don't we treat it that way? Like in the movies where people stand up and cheer for the underdog. And I said, you know, all these years, I've just been selling myself short. And I stopped, and I thought, that sounds like a book title. I said, Bill, I'm writing a book. This is helping me, maybe it will help others. Now that didn't turn out to be the title. It's nothing short of joy, because there was already a book out there called Don't Sell Yourself Short about achondroplasia, and I, my editor did not want me to have a title that was anything close to another one. God forbid they go buy that book. So my husband and I brainstormed and we came up with the second half of my life was nothing short of joy. And my book, which I didn't know at the time, was going to launch me into the world in a way I never thought I could handle, never realized how much I was going to be offering others and to feel now there was a purpose for the pain that I went through. And when my book was getting ready for uh, its publication, my editor asked if I would write to some authors I respected, some public figures to get endorsements. Because as a new author, you really need those little blurbs from somebody known in order to get readers interested. So my first thought was Wayne Dyer, who is a world-renowned self-help guy. He's probably the top in his field. But big name, very busy. It was a long shot. But I was starting to really realize that when you dream big, big things can happen. So I wrote him. And he wrote back and said he would endorse the book. I was over the moon. I was feeling five feet tall. And then, about six weeks later, my husband and our two kids, who are seven and 11, upstairs, don't want to listen to mom talking, we were coming home from a basketball, I mean a bowling birthday party, and my husband came in first and he hit the play button on our answer machine, and whose voice? came out, but Wayne Dyer, calling my house. This would be like your favorite celebrity calling you. That's how I saw him. I had been listening to him for probably 20 years. His tapes, his voice was so peaceful, so wise, that when my own negative tapes were going on, I would put his tape in and try and reprogram those old views of myself so I wasn't carrying them out in the world. And here he was, in not only endorsing my book, but really validating what I was up to. And I didn't even realize it was going to get better. When I heard his voice on the machine, I started jumping up and down and screaming. 
And I don't jump because I have replacements, but this was beyond. And I called him back when I realized, oh my gosh, I missed his call. And then he invited me to go up to Boston and sell my books at his event of a thousand people in this beautiful amphitheater. And when I got up there, his assistant said, no, we're going to have you in the front. You're sitting next to his daughter, Skye, who's going to be singing. And then when Wayne came down the aisle, came over, gave me a hug, leaned down and said, I'm going to call you on stage. Can you talk for a little bit? And I said, yes. Never talked before a group, ever. Why would I do that and want to be ridiculed and criticized and stared at for an hour? But it was Wayne Dyer asking. And so I sat there waiting to be called, thinking, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Am I going to be able to speak at all? Well, I walked up. I turned to the massive audience. And I spoke from my heart about my book, a little bit about myself. And I asked his daughter in the audience to get it on videotape because I had a camera there thinking, well, I'll get a photo with Wayne Dyer. Little did I know I'd have a video of myself. So it's on YouTube if you want to go look at it. Just search Julie Genovese, and there I am. And now you know the backstory that I was completely taken by surprise. But it was a fantastic experience, and it led me here to speaking of over the past two years. So you never know what will come of those yeses we say when our insides and our histories say, oh, no, 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 no. People might not like me. People might laugh hysterically and point at me. Entire school buses laughing at me. But it was a new day. There were new opportunities because my obstacles had become that incentive to move forward. And any of them can, little ones, big ones, we all have to make that a habit. And it's just our way of thinking, which changes our way of feeling. I think little people and those of you who know us come here with a great message of compassion, of understanding, of community. And we're here to transform other people's vision so that they're not just using their physical eyes. They're really going to the depth of who they are. A friend of the family emailed me about a year ago. She read my book, really loved it. It really shocked her. A lot of the things I had gone through, it shocked a lot of people, not realizing what it feels like to be stared at every day, questioned all the time. It was an eye-opener for a lot of people, including people who were close to me and that I had not shared with them because of my own shame. And this friend emailed and went on about the book, and then she said something really strange. She said, your siblings, I have five older siblings, one also has SED. And the two of us were born last. So when my brother Ethan was born, the doctors had told my mother, he's a mutation, won't happen again. And um, then I came along and my parents were shocked. They didn't know 48 years ago that it was genetically passed on. I don't know if that would have changed my parents' view at all, but other people believed that if you're willingly passing on your genetics, well, that's just, you know, unthinkable. And this friend said that my siblings had been angry when they found out they might be carriers. And I thought, really? Was I just in my own self-absorption, not realizing the pain that they carried? Or did they really know me and weren't worried about that? Well, I said, oh, I'm going to clear this right up. I'm going to email my sisters, who I'm close to, and my older brother, who I'm not close to, but I thought he would give me the truth. So my sisters emailed right back and said, I don't know what she's talking about. We never talked to her. We weren't worried because we loved you, and we thought whatever children we have are meant for us. 
us. And we know that you've made a good life, and so will they. And that these challenges make us stronger. <laughs> that we're all broken by something. No one goes out unscathed. But if we use it for the higher good, then it serves its purpose. So my sister said, you know, just ignore Jill. We don't know what that's about. It must be her own belief that we were angry. We, in fact, declined genetic testing when, our, when we, we were pregnant because we thought, what is the point? We are going to love that baby no matter what. And there are all sorts of things that can happen. It doesn't change how you love someone. So then the email came from my older brother. And normally someone, in very few words, it was an entire email past the screen, and I thought, oh boy. And I started to read, and he's going on and on about his happy memories of when my brother Ethan and I came home from the hospital. And Ethan, in particular, was in the hospital for two weeks after his birth because the doctors were so confounded. They didn't know what they were looking at. And they wanted to study and measure and x-ray and all those things we've been through. I knew it's okay. And so his point of view was that it was a celebration. And when he realized that my brother and I were different, which my parents, as I said, were silent. They did not talk about it. They did not want to point it out because they felt that would be negative. It kind of backfired on them. But their intentions were good. So my brother, when he discovered that we were different through his own young eyes, he felt very proud of my parents who clearly loved and accepted us like anybody else. And he said, when you and Ethan were born, we brought something special to our family that we didn't have before. Because although you brought a wound and a suffering, because we share in every suffering of yours, you also made us more human and therefore more happy. And that you deepened our humanity. Which is what we do. Because there's so much more to us. And that when other people get to know us, like Julie was talking on the set of the Extreme Home Makeover, people were very surprised by our approachability, by our normalness. And they felt their eyes open and their heart and mind open. And that feels good. To know that our own differences that we hide, whatever they are, and that we're able to hide, which we can't hide our dwarfism, but there are other things we can. Those things feel best when they're shared. And the struggles we go through are really what connect us. Joy and love and laughter, wonderful. But the struggles, those dark times, are really what deepen who we are and connect us with the depth and the soul of everyone who has ever lived, ever been through their own traumas. And we all have, and we all will. About six months ago, I had to go to the DMV. Who here likes to go to the DMV? <laughs> yeah, me either. And normally, I would always try and control my day. Because I didn't feel like I could control out there, but at least I could control my own decisions. And so I would always go to the DMV early in the day, early in the week, early in the month. But this week, we suddenly realized Bill was going out of town on business. I didn't want to bring the boys with me while he was gone, and I had to go that day, which was a Friday at noon at the end of the month. And I thought, oh no, this is going to be long. And as I'm driving over and I'm complaining in my head and grumbling, I think, wait a second. 
second ago, what am I doing? I've learned that you don't project that negativity out there. Because then you just get it back. You run into everybody else who's thinking that way. So I thought, no, stop. Tell a new story. Visualize what you want to have happen. Affirm that no matter what, you'll be in your strength. You'll be balanced and centered. So I started thinking, well, maybe I'll meet some great people. And then I started to affirm. The DMV has never operated so efficiently. The employees are so helpful and friendly, and I know just where to go, and the lines are clear, and the lines are moving like lightning, and by the time I get there and I'm telling this story, I'm feeling pretty good. And I think, well, okay, this is the point. Good feelings are just actually a thought away. And so if we practice, especially heading into something not so difficult, but unpleasant, like the DMV. We can use it for really tough situations with tough people. Preparing ourselves first, changing from within first. So we walk into the DMV, and a nice couple holds the door for me, we smile at each other, I land behind them in line. Before you know it, we're talking and laughing about all the paperwork we had to gather up to prove our identity to get our license again. And then the guy suddenly says, hey, the line's moving really quickly. I said, it is. And then I look up at the two women who are kind of the gatekeepers to the next line, and one is looking really kind of sour. But the other one is very animated, and she's got great eye contact with whoever she's talking to, and she kind of looks like she's enjoying it. And she reminds me of Joan Rivers. And I think, I want to get Joan. But by the time I get up there, the, the people in front of me land in Joan's line and think, oh, well, I'll be with Sour Sally, but maybe I can brighten her day. But Joan is so efficient that she moves her people quick, and I land before her. And I feel like she's a friend already, because I've been watching her. I said, hi, how are you? And she says, sweetheart, how are you? And I said, great. These the line is moving so quickly, and I think it's because of your efficiency. And she said, well, wait till the next line. And I said, it's all right. I'm going to enjoy myself anyway, and I can still hope that it will move along. And she said, add a girl. So she gets me on, and I'm going to sit down. I suddenly hear something, and I turn around, and it's Joan. And she's calling me, and so I walk toward her, thinking I forgot paperwork or something. And she says, uh, babe, cash, credit, check? And I said, oh, uh, credit. And I went to get it. She said, no, no, um, just go sit down. We'll call you in a few. And I thought, a few. That's their lingo for an hour. So we go sit down. I ask the woman next to me, so how long have you been here? And she says, 45 minutes. And everyone over there is ahead of us. And I thought, oh. All right, well, I'm going to read my book then. I'm going to spend my time reading, get out my little cookies that I pack. And before I can get out my book, I hear my name again. So I walk up to the counter, because it said line five. No one is in line five. And the woman asks for my paperwork, so I hand it to her. And I get chatting with the woman next to me. She tells me about the beautiful coat she's wearing. She bought it for her 50th birthday because she'd just gotten divorced, and this was her present, and I'm enjoying our conversation. And then the woman hands me my paperwork back, and I look down, and it looks like my new license. And I look up and I said, am I done? She said, you're done. I said, it's been 10 minutes. Well, that's unheard of. I've never gotten special treatment before. My parents taught me not to even ask for that. That, you know, I need to fit into the world and be strong in the world. And it had never happened. People did not say, come over here. No, I think they're afraid of, of <laughs> being, being rude, seeming rude. So I walked out. It was in a, a fog. Couldn't believe it. And I'm driving home, and I'm thanking my angels, thinking, they heard me. I asked for a party at the DMV. I asked to make it fun because we're all stuck there. And it worked. And then I realized.
realized, oh my gosh, it was Joan, and I didn't thank her. So I think, I'll go get one of my books, and I'll bring it back as a thank you. And I get home, I quickly tell my husband, I'm so excited, he says, get one of your books and bring it back to her. I said, that's what I'm going to do. So I try and think, what am I going to write for an inscription? I don't know who it is. So I write, my DMV angel, thank you for a magical experience. I'll never forget it. And I rush back, and Joan isn't there. But Sour Sally is there. So I ask her, is the woman you are working with still around? And she said, yeah, she's in the back. And he said, what's her name? And she said, Angela. My angel. So when I saw her, I gave her a big hug. She whispered in my ear, it's a two hour wait today, babe, and I just couldn't do it to you. And I whispered in her ear, you were the answer to a prayer. And she looked at me as if no one told her that her dreary job <laughs> meant something. You know, we need to shine light on other people's lives. We're so busy thinking about what's tough about our own and how other people have treated us badly that we forget other people may be struggling too. It's got to be tough working at the DMV where nobody ever wants to go. So I saw a great illustration that day, and I've seen many since. I could talk for hours of how this works when we change what's going on in our head and our heart. Things start to change out there. You gotta keep positive. I have a book up here, not my own, but another book. It was um, did anyone meet Russell Hayes this summer? He's an author. He was at the the conference. Did anyone see the Little People Big World episode where they had the Salmon family from Iraq? They are a family of five kids. Two of them have Morchio syndrome. They were living in Iraq in hiding from Saddam. They have the most incredible story. And this sergeant of the US military met them when he was deployed to Iraq. He has a daughter with a chondroplasia. So as soon as he saw this little note about this Iraqi family needs help, they need food, they were in a red zone, they couldn't leave Iraq, but they couldn't immigrate to the US, they were stuck. But because of their incredible faith and strength in themselves and in their own children, and the devastation they went through, gave them incredible inspiration to hang on until Russell came and he sponsored them to come to the US. And boy, did he have to struggle to do that. It was the 11th hour he was leaving Iraq after being there three years, trying for a year to get them visas. Very hard to do, especially seven people, because they wanted the whole family to come. Iraq, or many countries, want to keep at least part of the family so that the rest will come home. They managed to get all the visas. Drained Russell's life savings, but he did it. And it is a page turner. Um, he's trying to raise money for the youngest two who need neck stabilization surgery and they do not have insurance. The military does not sponsor them. Russell, as an individual, has sponsored them. So I have his book up here. I only have eight copies, but the kids have signed it. Um, their father has signed in Arabic. And it's an amazing, amazing read. I was just so inspired. So I'm hoping TLC will do a follow-up for them after um, the roll-offs helped them. They brought doctors over to Iraq for the first surgeries before they had their visa. Now they're here in the United States, but they need more surgery. So if you can help them out or donate at their site, which is dwarfchildren.com. Maybe it's not order. It's in the book. So. I love the idea that we always, always have a choice of how to handle our challenges. And there's an old Cherokee legend called Two Wolves. And it's about a grandmother speaking to her granddaughter. 
And the grandmother says, in every human heart, there live two mighty wolves. The first wolf believes that the greatest power in the universe is the power over others through fear, through anger, through separation, through judgment and criticism, through intolerance, through greed and selfishness, through darkness. And this wolf believes that we're all out there for ourselves anyway, and we're all alone in the world. The other wolf believes that the greatest power in the universe is the power to connect with others through love, through joy, through peace, through compassion and community, through deep caring and kindness. And that everyone is an important and beautiful thread in the great web of life. And that in the end, we're never really alone. And the grandmother says, these two wolves vie every day, every moment sometimes, for our attention, for our devotion, for our acceptance of their way of life. And the granddaughter says to the grandmother, well, which one will win? And the grandmother says, whichever one you feed. Because it's all out there, right? The good, the bad, everything in between. But we have the choice of which to feed, which to invite into our life. No matter what's happened to us, we have the ability to respond in a new, a new way. Not the old way of reacting and hiding, like I use, or anger and bitterness, but to say, how is this catapult? to something better and deeper and truer inside me. It's a huge responsibility to have that choice every day. And when we feel ourselves going into that negativity, stop. Tell a new story of not what has happened, but what you want to happen. What do you dream about? What do you see in someone else's life that you would like to manifest in your own? Because that starts the ball rolling. And we really have the ability to hold up the light of ourselves first and then hold the light for others to see their greatness, the magic that's inside of them. And we tra when we transform the way we look at things, we start to transform our entire life. And that ripples out to the people around us. Doug Hammers Gold is a, was a UN delegate. He was famous for writing about world peace and inner peace. And he said, become a mirror in which the greatness of life will be reflected. So when we clean out that inside and be the mirror for others who are in their own doubt and pain, then we've found what we came for. Not just for our own happiness, but the happiness of everyone around us as well. I'll leave you with my favorite quote from my hero Wayne Dyer who says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Okay. <laughs>